to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day and today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Kate Upcroft. Kate is a very experienced payroll professional who spent over 20 years at MS, latterly as legislation manager for the payroll function. During a time when MS employed 65,000 staff, Kate then launched her own business, Kate Upcraft Consultancy Limited, in 2005. Now, Kate is a renowned lecturer, consultant, and writer, and a contributing editor for the Global Payroll Association. And it was at the recent GPA UK Summit in London that we last met prior to today. Kate is widely respected as an expert on all aspects of payroll legislation, has been involved in high-level government lobbying and and consultations, where she has always worked tirelessly to improve the payroll industry for all. I'm really delighted to have Kate join us on this payroll podcast. There are very few people that I know in the payroll industry that has more expertise, more knowledge, and gives more back to the payroll industry than Kate Upcraft. So really, really delighted to have you on board, Kate. Welcome. Thank you very much, Nick. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here and thank you for that kind welcome. I oh, know you're very welcome indeed. It's an absolute privilege. So for those listeners that are new to the podcast, we always start with five questions. Five technical questions. Let's start at the beginning. Tell me what it was like to manage one of the largest payrolls in the country. Well, at the beginning, it was incredibly scary because I had no idea what I'd let myself in for. I was an HR manager in a store who very stupidly thought that she could become payroll manager or one of the four payroll managers at that time. And because I thought as an HR manager, I knew everything about payroll. And I learned in that first week that I knew absolutely nothing about payroll from the HR perspective. But I soon learned that much better there than as an HR manager. It was very um, fulfilling, hugely frustrating at times in terms of what we got to get done with the resources we had, but hugely fulfilling to be doing that role in the end. It's quite an interesting change as well, because most people want to aspire to go into HR, but you went the other way. So you went from being an HR manager into more of a payroll focused role. What was the reason for that change? Absolutely. Well, I um, wanted, first of all, to be moving less around the country, which if you're in a retail, um, if you're in HR and stores, obviously you've got to move from store to store. So it was an opportunity to move into a head office function. Um, And I thought that uh, what I'd done previously would fit me very well for that head office function. And yes, of course, the people management side was important because I had about a team of 40 um, in the payroll function in head office. But the technical aspects of what I was suddenly doing were the huge learning curve. But that very much suited my skill set. And I met some very exciting and interesting people in that role who helped me with that. Fantastic. What was the steepest learning curve for you then to begin with? You obviously already had that management expertise in terms of managing large teams. But what was the steepest learning curve from a payroll perspective? I think there were two, really. First of all, learning the payroll software we were using, which in those days, and, and there were one or two people who were using it, was uh, the famous UniPay, which so many retailers um, used, which was a DOS-based system. Some of the younger listeners won't even know what that means, um, but it was a <laughs> way that big payrolls were run on mainframes back in the day because I am an old lady, so this was in 1990 that I first became part of the payroll team. Um, So learning the technical side, but then, of course, learning the legislation that supported everything that we did was very different in HR from the point of view that we were really working more to company policies, whereas in payroll, it was company policies on the back of, well, does the law let us do this? Sure. Even I remember UniPay, which shows my age as well, (laughs) before it became Rebus and it changed hands several times. But it must have been those days then when systems weren't quite as advanced, been very very manually based, even despite the size of the payroll. It must have been quite heavily oh, manually incredibly. Focused. And that was the only thing I'd ever known as an HR manager, sending a load of paper timesheets off on a Saturday night. And magically, you know, those 65,000 people got paid. And I got a little bunch of pay slips back about 10 days later, which I just dished out. When I then walked into that department as one of the management teams to see 300 plus brown envelopes arriving on a Monday morning, which went off to something called a punch bureau in those days, which created those timesheets onto magnetic tapes that then got loaded <laughs> onto a main and then eventually um, got transmitted into an overnight batch run. So you know, completely different to anything that any professional coming into the profession today would experience, incredibly manual. And the amount of paper output, the amount of trees we must have got rid of at MS every Tuesday night when we actually run the payroll. 
be seen to be believed. <laughs> sure, I would just imagine if uh, they brought GDPR in then with what you'd have to contend with oh, if it was all so yes. paper based. <laughs> I'm very glad I'm not there now. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you've had significant experience, I think it's fair to say, managing high-performing payroll and HR teams. What are the key skills that you believe make a great manager? Well, resilience, I think, is the key one. You are never, ever going to get a phone call that says, thank you for paying me properly. You're constantly going to get, I've forgotten to do this. My pay is 10p less than, less than last month. How dare you have done this to my tax code because people think you're HMRC. So you've got to have very broad shoulders. You've got to want to and demonstrate a real work ethic because whatever needs to be done, you've got to put those hours in because ultimately – People have got to be paid on time and the business's assets have got to be protected and you're managing their business asset, which is their salary bill. So from that perspective, that's vital. Customer care is hugely important because all of those 65,000 people and the pensioners were our customers. And therefore, what we were always focusing on is how we could do things better for them and all the stakeholders that we provided information to internally and externally. So the skill set was all about customers, resilience, and also taking processes forward, always looking to improve things, to do the best with the resources that we had, because we were a cost to the company, absolutely, as, as a team. And you want to do whatever you can to reduce that cost and manage that salary bill as best you can. Sure. So that must be a bit of an advantage coming from that HR background. because That's a kind of an HR mentality as well, always looking at process improvements and improving lines of communication. I'd be interested to know, going from an HR management background then, where I guess you've got employees coming to you with requests that are going to benefit their career in a slightly different way. Maybe that's to do with appraisal, promotion or whatever, going into an environment where most of the calls you're dealing with are maybe more complaint orientated because perhaps pay is incorrect or they're questioning something in their pay, particularly because, as we know, payroll is the largest cost of any organisation. So that's that's also a a cultural shift. How did you find that change for you from a management perspective, going into an environment that perhaps the type of complaint or the type of query from an employee you were dealing with on a daily basis changed? Well, it's twofold, really. Of course, I was managing the employees who actually worked for me. And a lot of the time was about the development work of the team and how we were um, going to make sure we had the talent pipeline to to ultimately, you know, replace me and take people forward in their own careers. So we were always looking to recruit and develop. But equally, of course, as you say, when I would get um, involved in an issue that was coming in from one of our stakeholders out in stores or within head office, it was either a technical issue or things related such that there was then an enormous amount of um, placating and solving, uh, and particularly among, among the senior people, because I'd obviously look after some of the directors and the expatriates directly because of the seniority of the people there. So, yes, there's a twofold group that you looked after, really, but quite different to it, to a store HR management role, which is very much, you know, can I go to the doctors this afternoon, having got enough people to put the people on the tills, put the lunches, do all the things sure. that we do today. So, yeah, quite different, but still people and people need looking after. No, I completely agree. If you could give one piece of practical advice to those listening out there that either are moving into a management role or want to improve their management experience, or perhaps they're going to a new position that has a much bigger team, what's the one sort of key takeaway or one piece of practical advice you would give to, to someone in, the, in, in that situation? Find somebody else within the organisation in a management role that you aspire to and get yourself a mentor that you can use as a sounding board because you will be at times incredibly lonely when you take your first steps into a management role and you need somebody not necessarily in the same sort of discipline at all but somebody that you might have worked with or you have identified even through the recruitment process that you think this person can help me enormously um, just when I need to offload when I need advice and I don't want to perhaps show my hand with my own team about vulnerabilities that. I think for a young aspiring first steps into management would be my takeaway. Fantastic. Love that. Thank you ever so much for that insight. You're the Deputy Chair of the Employment Tax and NI Committee at the ICAEU and Chair of the Reward and Employment Engagement Forum as well. 
What have you been working on with these groups and with government policymakers recently? Okay. Well, in fact, uh, our latest meeting of the Reef Group, which is the Reward and Employment Forum, that was yesterday, and I chaired that, and we actually held it at ICAW yesterday um, because I am a member of the tax faculty at the Institute of Chartered Accountants because you might think, well, why would Kate be a member of ICAW? She's not an accountant, but, of course, ICAW does have its own tax faculty and employment tax is one of the huge focuses of the tax faculty. So yesterday we had visitors in the morning from the Treasury and from Bayes who were talking to us about the employment status work and the Matthew Taylor report and what that's led to within government. And we were talking to them about the difficulties of trying to work out the difference between employees, workers and the self-employed. So we spent a good two and a half hours with them. Then we were joined by the head of customer engagement from HMRC, Neil Chappell, who comes to talk to us every time we have a meeting about um, the employer piece and what developments are going on in terms of stakeholder collaboration. And we were very much feeding back that we are very keen and very desperate almost as, as various rep bodies to do a lot more collaboration, which we think has fallen off um, in the last few years to the point that it's now meaning that we're getting poor legislation, guidance that isn't there or isn't fit for purpose and is too late. And we were just making a plea to say there's a huge willingness and technical expertise out there to assist HMRC, which is very resource strapped and doesn't have some of the technical expertise it latterly had because a lot of people have retired. So it was really a, a plea to Neil, you know, we're willing to help just let us in and let us do what we can for our profession by telling you how it is here at the coal face. And that was very much the sort of theme of yesterday's day with them. It's all about guidance and legislation and We're drowning in legislation at the moment in terms of the payroll profession and policymakers want to keep taking things forward and they want employers to do it because we do it well and we do it for nothing. But it's becoming impossible to turn on a sixpence against the backdrop of last minute changes. So what in your mind is one of the reasons behind the fact that the collaboration level has reduced from from their perspective, from HRC perspective? Do you think there's a a reason or an objective or, or an obstacle that's that's preventing i'm perfectly frank i think it's that the more you collaborate and listen to stakeholders the more you've got to change tack and revisit and reiterate and that costs time and money and if a minister has said sure. to you, it's delivered and we want x amount of revenue bought in at a specific point working and engaging with stakeholders takes time and that sadly seems to be one of the reasons why it doesn't happen But that only means in the end that you potentially bring in less revenue. And that's what we kept saying yesterday, because the guidance about two of the particular changes that happened in the last year is so bad, people won't be paying the right tax and NI over because they don't even know that the law has changed. So in a way, this will not be ministerial objectives, because actually, if you did spend the time engaging, you drive up the exchequer revenue anyway. So it's a bit of a catch 22, this. And uh, more than a tad frustrating, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> There's a slight chicken and egg scenario, but I guess maybe at an earlier stage then, do you think that they do enough to engage experts like yourself before policy is made, before they launch some of these policies that cause problems later? Do you think there's enough consultation pre-policy with experts like yourself? And there used to be um, very much that collaborative, confidential soundings. We're thinking of doing this. And we would often be the ones saying, yeah, but you you probably don't remember we tried that 15 years ago and it didn't work in that guy. So let's try a different tack. But because that, and I've written about this this week, because there's a very interesting report out about government losing its corporate memory. Because so many people have retired and there are so many youngsters coming in who never stay on a project or an area within government for long enough to get that corporate memory. It's only the stakeholders that remember what's happened historically who can save them from a lot of dark alleys that are pointless. Um, If there was that engagement at the beginning, those of us with old heads on our shoulders, we're not doom mongers of saying you can't do that. We just don't want to waste time reinventing something that we know we've tried before and there are ways of doing things. It's interesting because I see it, obviously I'm not as anything like involved as you are, Kate, at the technical level with this. I see it from my armchair, if you like, I'm an armchair viewer. But I find look at some of the things that happen, it's they seem to be more focused on trying not to be left behind from a technology point of view, you know, making sure that you can do things via Alexa or they've got the latest technology, don't really focus on the genuine problems that are 
preventing payroll professionals from delivering as well as they could? Absolutely. I mean, this is the whole drive with the digitization is absolutely a given because of the headcount reductions and the fact that they're losing 170 tax offices and going to 13. So managing that property change and the digitization that's a result of the headcount is a massive change on its own. Then you've got to overlay all the Brexit stuff. And all we kept saying to the civil servants who were with us is, I hope you are saying to ministers, no, minister, we cannot do all of this at the same time because our customers won't get the service they need from us. We don't have the access to ministers. We rarely get enough access to civil servants, but I'm not sure we're getting that there is a strong enough pushback to say, I know John Thompson has been said that he needs to reprioritize. He's head of HMRC and he's told ministers that. But I hope that there will be some, we're not going to do this now because we simply know we can't do it well enough and we're pushing it back for a bit. And that would be a very sensible, pragmatic, and I think well-received response to some of this stuff. We've got a new type of national insurance net coming in next April. We haven't even got the primary legislation for it. It's been delayed one year already, and yet they think it'll still happen next April. There are two months before we need a specification for this, and we haven't even got the legislation. So there's no understanding of the time lag that it requires to deliver digital projects on our side when there ought to be because they're so busy doing digital projects on their side. And that's, that's a bit strange. Absolutely. And as you know, payrollers are busy enough still handling GDPR compliance, it affects all divisions. You've got gender pay gap reporting. There's legislation that is always changing. It's almost like they forget how much they've already got on their plate and then something else changes and there's something else to implement. And it's um from your mind, is there anything if I was a stat, you know, a payroll manager at the moment, working in industry and I wanted to get involved, is there something I can do to try and support change and try and support some of the things that you're doing? At a lobbying level or consultation level, is there anything that I can do or can be seen to be doing to improve things at my level? Absolutely. I mean, every consultation that's out there, you can respond as a member of the public or as a member of representative bodies. So if you are a member of CIPP or like me, ICAEW or any other representative body, you can either um, feed in through them or feed in independently. But equally, all of the work that I do, because I'm also a member of the Charter Institute of Tax and their Employment Tax Committee, we are volunteers who give up time to sit round at the table with other like-minded professionals to put together responses and lobbying stances. And all of the representative bodies are desperate for professionals who will put some of their own time and expertise forward to help with that. You know, and for people like me who are self-employed, you don't get paid for doing any of that, but I do it because this profession has given me a great career and a great living. It's the least I can do to put something back into this profession at the end of my career. But it doesn't need to be the old heads like me. The youngsters are the people who are going to be the future of this profession. And if they want to make a difference, they will be welcomed with open arms by all the people who are out there wanting to listen. What a fantastic response. I'm really glad I asked the question. (laughs) I think it ties in nicely as well with with my next question. You know, as you mentioned, a lot of this you do on a voluntary basis. You're hugely passionate about the payroll industry and and making it better for everyone within the industry, which is fantastic. And as a result of of that and and other things that you've done within the payroll industry, Kate, you were recognized uh, with a Lifetime Achievement Award by Pay Magazine in November 2005. So how did that feel? Well, actually, it was rather odd because that was the point I was really just launching my um, self-employed business. And it was like, well, if if I finish now and I'm just about to become self-employed and I've got a Lifetime Achievement Award, this is a very bad set of timings that I'm just thinking. (laughs) So it was lovely to be recognized by my peers. I still don't know who put me forward for that award. But it was a very nice um, moment as I was just, as I say, coming out of roles that I'd done at MS and other things and then going off on my own. So I hope it was just saying this is what you've done so far, but it's still all right for you to do a bit more because <laughs> I'm still here 13 years later. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, I've got my recruitment hat on. If I was going self-employed and that was the last thing I got, what a great way to start a business, you know, because you're starting with having just won the lifetime. You've um, and actually just go back slightly on, on the voluntary. You mentioned that you know, you're doing it for the future of the industry. But actually, with my recruitment hat on, it's also a great way for payroll managers or any payroll professionals to really raise their profile, uh, raise their own knowledge, raise their own expertise, network with senior professionals within the industry. So there is actually a personal career development element to it if they want to get involved. It may not be remunerated in terms of salary, but actually that kind of experience and networking 
can really help remunerate you later, either in terms of experience or just opening up opportunities. And that's the you know one of the reasons that I volunteer for so many things because it's CPD for me. I can can't no way do I know at all everything that is going on legislatively or in our industry. But the more that I network with much cleverer people than me, I will pick up, well, I haven't thought about that aspect. And every time, like yesterday's meeting, I walked away thinking, yeah, like, nobody's mentioned that before and I hadn't thought about that. So you never stop learning in payroll every day. And the more you can expose yourself to other people's ideas, yeah, all to the good. And every time it raises your own profile, which is what everyone wants if you're looking for that development yeah. path in, in your career. Absolutely. For those interested in finding out about some of the services, you offer health checks, training, consultancy, and you speak at a number of events, there's blogs, there's loads of information you can get, which is at katupcraft.com. Just tell me a little bit more about your consultancy work. Tell me a little bit about how your career has developed from a consultancy point of view since 2005. Okay, so if you look at a typical week now, I'll probably be lecturing two or three days a week somewhere in the country because I have two training providers that I work for extensively delivering um, training, but I also have lots of private clients that I go and see their payroll teams on site um, at different times in the year to bring them up to date with what's going on. So the rest of the week, I'm either writing about this sort of stuff, um, whether it's writing online material, because I'm one of the editors for Expert HR, I write the employment part of the Employment Law Manual, I write a, a newsletter each month for another client. But when it comes to actually consultancy, the thing that I love most, and I don't get the time to do as many projects in a year as I'd like, so usually only two or three, is to go in and do that audit work, that health check work, going into a team who, for whatever reason, think that either it's time to look at a new system or look at a new um, structure. Perhaps they might be bringing payroll in-house from outsourced. Perhaps they're a, a team that are bringing HR and payroll together. Perhaps they've just grown very quickly. Um, so it's always a different reason that come, people come to me. Um, in fact, this week I've met somebody on a course who's in that scenario where the business has grown very, very quickly and probably the processes and the resourcing is not keeping up to speed with now how big they are. And so I may well go and do um, some work with them in the next few months just to have a look at what we can do to try and put some frameworks around what they need to do to get them compliant and just help the finance controller sleep at night, I think, is probably the best way to describe it. If you are looking or they're struggling with resourcing, I, I won't give any names away, but I know we're uh, yeah. going to help. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> on the consultancy side just reading your profile looking at your website i can feel exhausted just not quite understanding how you find the time to stay up to speed because you, you're covering two industries so you're you've got to be up to speed to lecture and teach in, in particular on all aspects of legislation on the hr side and the payroll side so how do you manage your time and how do you manage to stay up to speed with both industries which would usually be enough for just one person well, manage my time is something I probably do very badly because I still sort of do six and a half days a week. But it's very much, I said about finding a mentor and a network. I could not manage without a small group of people, probably less than 10, that I will email and be talking to every single week, some of them every day saying, have you seen that? What do you reckon to that piece of case law? There's a piece of legislation in the offing there. Because I work on my own, because I don't employ anybody else in the business, that having that good network of people to go to, to bounce ideas off is absolutely vital. And that would be the case for all payroll professionals in the small to medium sized businesses where you probably are the only expert. You do need other people within the industry that you can talk to on a cultural sure. basis. And then there's a vast amount of reading subscribing to and you work out which um, blogs which news feeds are the ones that are going to give you the insight that you need and a bit by bit sure. tone those down but yes what i want to do when i retire more than anything is to be able to read for pleasure not have to read another consultation or another tax blog or something <laughs> like that so that will be the biggest change for me and i do worry that the amount of volume that we all need in the profession to retain what all the stuff that we've known and the newness, that's the biggest challenge, I think, for any payroll professional now is how do you just keep on top of all of this and do the day job? 
And I take my hat off to payroll professionals sure. managing to do that. I only run four small payrolls now as a volunteer to keep my hand in. And that keeps me busy enough, let alone these people who are running large payrolls like I did when I was at m and I love the way we added as a volunteer again. You know, it's just because I've got a bit more extra time. I'll just do four more payrolls. It's only four. It'll be five. I, th- I think what does come through though and in droves, which is your enthusiasm for payroll and your enthusiasm for what you do. Or I guess you wouldn't do all the voluntary work, do you? But I think to make any successful self-employed, if you like, consultancy as successful as yours is, you've got to be passionate about what you do. And that really comes through which is fantastic. So look, I should also add, I have subscribed to you while I'm on this podcast so that I can make sure I get your latest update. <laughs> so um, for the podcast, we're going to find out a little bit more about you. Time to find out more about you. How would your friends describe you or how would your work colleagues describe you? Well, I suppose from the point of view of work colleagues, we're talking about the people that I work on the committees with and that I liaise with. And I probably, sure. if we're being entirely honest, they'd say I was one of those, as was described, bloody difficult women because I am passionate <laughs> about what I do. I don't give civil servants an easy time because I don't think that's my role. My role is to push back for our profession. And if that means you have to be stroppy at times, then so be it. But I think that's a very different role than obviously the role I want to portray to the profession who I'm trying to sure to work with. But yeah, I think they'd probably say passionate stroke stroppy and never stops talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I can actually understand that. I mean, from a recruitment perspective, when a client calls and says they want something, our job is also to push back because was what we do and we're there to advise. And if you want to advise professionally and accurately, you sometimes have to push back, got sometimes give some quite honest advice. And whether that's about salary being incorrect or difficulties in a search, you've got to give that back. Because if you don't and you take the route of water, you end up just not delivering. You know, that the same with for yourself if you're dealing with the HMRC, for example, or civil servants, if you're not giving that honest feedback, then it doesn't progress. No, um, that's right. Isn't it? So I, I, I think passion, it's passion. It's passion. <laughs> anyway. Often with the audit work that I do, when you go back to present an audit report at the end, you'll be meeting senior people and you are not being true to them or perhaps junior people that have engaged you to do the work. If you don't actually put across what they might have been struggling to get senior people to hear. So you've done a huge disservice to them if you say, yeah, everything's great when it isn't great. And the reason it isn't great is that senior people perhaps haven't been focused on it enough. And therefore, you do have to deliver some difficult messages as tactfully as possible. And sometimes those difficult messages will even result in some people having to leave the business who've not been delivering correctly. So you've got to be mindful that sometimes you're being called in to shoot bullets that other people don't feel that they can shoot. So you do need those broad shoulders and that willingness to say the unsayable. I guess that's the nature of consultancy to be able to give agnostic advice that you feel is the most fit for purpose. Then, you know, at least you've been true to yourself and what they've paid you to do, you have done. All you can do then is say to the business, it's my business, this is what I do. Sure. So tell the listeners then something about you, if you don't mind, that perhaps other people won't know. Okay, so um, when I'm um, on the sort of half a day a week that I'm not writing about payroll, I'm a huge foodie and uh, my husband and I really spend a lot of our spare time going around the country, going to Michelin star, well not just around the country, but going around Europe, visiting Michelin starred restaurants and loving what we're eating because we love cooking and we love food and that's what our sort of spare time such as it is we have. He's a regional director for Waitrose, so he's obviously very involved in the food industry Wow. That's, I suppose it's a bit like Colston, Newcastle, but uh, yeah, that's what we spend our spare time doing. Well, that's fantastic. Do you have a personal preference of a restaurant? That's very difficult to say because I've been to so many wonderful places. I'm hoping that I'm, what I'm going to be saying at Whitson because that weekend we're going to Paul Bacuse's restaurant in Lyon. Paul Bacuse has actually just died in his 90s, but one of the most famous Michelin star chefs in the world. And we're lucky enough to be going to lunch there. So I'm hoping that might be the biggest highlight of my foodie career because I've never been to a three Michelin star restaurant anywhere before. So how much it's costing to go, it better be good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of foodie as well. So my wife's a wife set let me wino. So wow. um, I get it. I'm usually excited to go. I've never been to a three Michelin star. My personal favourite, I had one would be the Marcus Waring. But um, yes, no, to Marcus Waring. Fantastic. I'm wonderful. very <laughs> jealous. I'm very jealous. So for those that aren't familiar with the podcast, we have slightly um, some interesting questions just to get a little bit more of an insight into you. So 
You're abducted by aliens and they want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? Well, I've had a little think about this and I think I'd take an iPhone because we're all so attached to this that an alien might think they're actually an extra part of our bodies because for so many youngsters, <laughs> my two daughters, I don't think they are ever physically detached from their iPhone. So I would explain to them how this thing, both the most marvellous thing and the most awful thing in terms of social interaction that we've ever in <laughs> invented in this country or not well, in this world. Well, great response. Have you heard of that there is something called phantom vibration syndrome, a genuine thing that exists where people check their pockets, I think on average of seven or eight, eight times a day, thinking their phone is vibrating, oh, but it hasn't. Goodness. <laughs> that is <scary. laughs> Just kick us into contact. That's scary. <laughs> very scary. Very scary. What game or instruments would you teach them? Well, I played a piano. Well, I did as a youngster. So I would take along a piano and try and show them what this uh, piece of string and wood, etc., does and what can come out at the end of it. Excellent. Very multi-talented. Fantastic. What would you tell them about humans? <laughs> well, I think I'd go down there because they're aliens. Um, from the human point of view, it really is true that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. There is no comparison between <laughs> these two types of human beings. Um, we are very complementary at times, but equally, we couldn't be more different. So they should never make assumptions that humans are just one species. They're very much not. <laughs> Absolutely love that. That's my favourite response so far. Brilliant. What truth or human trait would you hold back? Oh, well, yeah, I think human beings are very good at saying one thing and thinking or doing another. So what you see isn't what you get. That's a skill I've had to hone in consultations over the years. In fact, yesterday, at one point, I thought I was going to explode with some of the things I was hearing. And you have to keep smiling and thinking something entirely different in your head. That seems to be a common um, answer I'm getting on that question as well, so I think we all feel the same, yeah. Five technical questions. So question here. Since 2005, you've become a very experienced technical writer, editor and lecturer, and I know that you cover a very wide range of payroll and HR matters. How do you see the industry changing in the next three to five years? Well, I think we'll see artificial intelligence developing even in our particular profession. So there'll be a lot more automation of tasks. But what that will leave is that the people who are still very much needed are going to be very much of a technical nature. And I get a bit frustrated, and you must do as well, Nick, when I hear people going for payroll jobs who think payroll is a data input job. And it's not. Sure. And if that's what people think payroll is about now, they're going to get the shock of their lives in the next five to 10 years because it won't be that at all. There'll be none of that data inputting type role. It'll all be about systems and understanding legislation and process development. It will become a very technically adept role. And of course, as we've said, huge management expertise because you are managing a large amount of money for people who want you to do it as seamlessly as possibly. So that's where I think we'll be seeing the profession go in the next few years. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's always been analytical, but I think it's going to become more technically mm. analytical, more reporting focused, which I think is a great because those analytics and reports can really drive strategic decision making at board level. It can really help elevate the payroll industry in the sense that they're going to have access to much more data, if you like, as, as more and more becomes automated, mm. that can be used to make and drive business related decisions. Yeah. So I think it's quite exciting. Mm. And you're absolutely right on the on the system piece. One of the tasks we have is to ascertain those that press buttons and those that actually process payroll. People don't always understand what a payroll person really does. Yeah. And that's obviously part of our role to, to educate. On that side, is there something you would recommend to help them prepare themselves for the changes that are coming in that will prevent them, if you like, from being, I don't wanna say the word left behind, but I can't think of a better way of putting it. But anything you would recommend they started doing now in preparation. You've got to take your own personal development very seriously and keep badgering your organisation to take it seriously. Obviously, I meet the organisations where it is being taken seriously because they're the ones who are coming on courses that I deliver, where the teams have got a payroll who asked me to go in and, and review processes. But there are 1.8 million PAYE schemes out there and there are hundreds and thousands of employers where this is not being taken seriously. So what we've got to get the payroll professionals to do is to be demanding and saying, I cannot just carry on 
doing what I'm doing year on year without getting some professional development because that will cost you money. It's a huge compliance risk if people don't know what they're doing. And we're starting to see, because this is a consultation that I'm involved in at the moment, the fact that we have a tax exemption for being trained by our employer, we don't have that same protection if we want to do our own personal development because those costs that we might incur of trying to develop our skill set if our employer won't, we don't get those tax relieved. And that's something that the government are addressing sure. now, because one of the productivity barriers in this country is is a poor skills. And, and it really, we need to level the playing field. But I would be very demanding. And if I was going into a role and there wasn't a commitment to developing me professionally, I'd be walking away because I'd be very concerned about the nature of that business if that was the way they handle themselves. I used to get frustrated at M&S because there was a huge culture of development within the finance function. We were in the HR function as a payroll team. And there it was all, we don't need any external training because what we do is all internal. And that, and I was one of the first people ever to take my IPPM diploma as it was in those days because it had been unheard of for somebody within payroll to actually get a qualification. It was all homegrown training. And we, that culture is a culture of the past. We've got to be looking externally and keep our skills up to date. Excellent response. Well, would you recommend that they approach an HR director for that kind of support? It depends what function you fit within, whether you are in HR or, HR or finance, but you've really got to get both on side because any HR director who isn't en- interested in the professional development of anybody in the organisation is in the wrong role anyway. And the finance director ought to be hugely, particularly if they're a senior accounting officer, because they've got that responsibility to um, sign off accurately their PAYE compliance. How on earth could you have a payroll team that are not adequately trained and sign on that dotted line? Because what finance directors in the private sector have particularly got to be mindful of since September of last year is there's now a corporate criminal offence of tax evasion. And that means directors can go to jail if there are people in their organisation who are, whether it's wittingly or unwittingly, facilitating tax evasion by not knowing what the law is and applying it properly. So if there was ever a lever to say to the senior person, I think I could do with some training because I'd like to keep you out of jail, I think that's a conversation I'd want to have as a finance director. Well, great response. I'm really glad I asked the (laughs) question. So there you take that away and we'll have people writing their pictures, (laughs) which is good. It'll mean people get developed. It's fantastic. So we've touched upon some of them already, but what are the generic problems you come across within payroll And are there any common solutions you can recommend that could perhaps instantly help mitigate risk or or reduce costs? Right. Well, we've obviously, as we've just been touching on, the lack of senior involvement is very important. So you've got to try and leverage a seat at the table or access to the senior people so that they understand the risks that are going on within the business. You don't want to be the person who opens the envelope to a winding up order from HMRC because something's gone wrong with the PAY, not because you've done anything wrong, but because the senior people don't understand that things don't work necessarily well in RTI at the revenues end. And that can lead to all sorts of assumptions about the business. So engaging with the senior people and also engaging with what HMRC are doing with your data From an RTI perspective, it's absolutely vital so that you protect your own reputation and the businesses. But the area now that HMRC are completely turning their attention to, and they've written to the largest businesses in the country in the last two weeks, is to say that we want to focus on benefits and expenses now. We're not that bothered about PAYE from that perspective, because if you're using decent payroll software, you're getting the right people and the right amounts through taxing and NIing them, the system will do that. But what they are concerned about is all the stuff under the radar, all the things you're doing for people, giving to people that never make their way onto a P11D or into a settlement agreement. And there's all that untapped tax and NI. So they're certainly the large business clients I've talked to in the last few weeks. All the compliance reviews are around process flows, controls, analyzing data from systems. And there's a, you know a lot of support out there with new, particularly from the big four, new tools that will help sure. businesses to pull all that data together before HMRC come in and do the same exercise and ask questions about what's that expense claim? Why are you paying that tax free? And that's the new focus, really. So the more people can now turn their attention to expenses and benefits and tightening all of that up, that's where they're going to make some real savings in terms of reducing risk. Fantastic answer. That ties in really nicely with the next question. You kind of touched upon it already. But in recruitment, we talk a lot about the risks and costs associated with a poor hiring decision. But I was going to ask, what are the risks and costs associated with getting payroll wrong? I think you've touched upon some of those 
already. But are there any additional risks that perhaps worth mentioning? Well, I suppose that the new risk that we've all had to accommodate really since 2012 is our regulation is not just with HMRC, it's with the pension regulator. And because the regulator has criminal opportunities and offences that it can levy, we've already seen prosecutions for enrolment failings. And this week, we've seen a, the first big high profile one, if you like, with a pub chain that are being taken to court by the regulator. So we've suddenly become had to become pension experts who are subject to a regulator that's got even more draconian powers than HMRC. So that's a risk in itself. We've talked about the potential prison, which is quite drastic in the private sector. But fundamentally, of course, there's the employee relations risk. You know, if you are getting things wrong, what is that doing to people who are not going to stay with you? Um, you know, my husband has had various jobs in retail over his career. And one of them, I won't mention who it is with, of course, in the 15 months he worked for them, never paid him once correctly the whole time he was there. And he was a senior manager, not that it matters how senior he was, but that's tarnished his view of them. And he would never go back and work for that particular retailer. So it does matter that when we start people on the payroll, we begin a good relationship by paying them accurately. We pay them accurately through the time they're with us and we part company accurately as well because they will be our future customers, people who will tell others, don't even go and think of working for them, they'll never pay you properly. So don't underestimate that employee relations damage that payroll function can avoid if it's well structured and well managed. I don't know what to say. I wasn't expecting that response, but I'm so passionately <laughs> agree. When I saw you at the GPA, I was giving a talk, a keynote speech on the cost of a poor hiring decision. And actually, that was very much centered around not just the cost, you know, in terms of lost salary and those things that people or recruitment fees, even that you've lost because the person hasn't worked out. The actual, the greater value is much more in damaged employer brand, mm. employee attrition, turnover, a low morale workforce, all those things that can be affected just all stems or potentially could stem from an incorrect or a poor performing payroll yeah. operation. And that's obviously some of the risks of hiring talent that doesn't have that essential payroll expertise that you need if you want to run a payroll effectively. And, you know, we speak to lots of businesses that go, actually, we don't need that. We're going to train it internally. A payroll manager who has had no previous experience, but we feel it's just payroll. They just press buttons. It'll be fine. And it's like, look, you don't understand the longer risk, the bigger risks. Yeah. You need to mitigate those and you can mitigate them but you're not because you're worried about, you know, a recruitment fee or whatever it might be. So um, you've done some of my job for me there, but it's, I'm really passionate about the same thing. It's not about the front loaded cost of a recruitment exercise. And that doesn't mean necessarily using an agency, whether you pay it for an advert or whatever source you use. Think longer term. Think about if the cost of getting that hire wrong far outweigh any front loaded cost of getting the person in. So 100 percent agree. So thanks for that. That's uh, quite passionate about that size. <laughs> you can make the point of view that there's still an underpayment element here, as in people not being paid the right job rate for payroll. I've met a number of people this week when I've been out lecturing this week down south, where people have been dropped into payroll in the last two or three weeks at very very low salaries, who were perhaps purchase ledger clerks because the perception is they don't need any skills, and we're talking people on low twenties who are now suddenly the payroll manager. And I find this hugely concerning that I don't think there is that proper salary scale that recognises the technical stuff here. Oh, my God, 100%. And we see it all the time. It kind of depends on how much the individual or the function you report into, whether that's HR finance, values payroll. If that HR director really values the contribution the payroll makes, you tend to find that the salaries are, are commensurate with where I think they should be. But if it's, as you said, the finance director has said, you work in purchase ledger, our payroll person's left, how about you move across? You can already sense they feel it's an unskilled area and they pay accordingly. And some of the salaries for positions we work with are, well, actually, to be honest, we turn some positions away because it's just not possible for us to recruit. Yeah. It's too low. Because there's, there's no point people thinking um, that that is what people are valued at in the industry and, and the recruitment industry you know, do have a big role to say, we, we know what's going on from a venture market perspective and you're way off the pace here. There are some really good employers. I have to say there are some people that pay absolutely at Benchmark. Uh, they're great and they give good progression opportunities. They support qualifications, all those things. There are some brilliant employers, but they're, Equally, there are definitely some, and without mentioning any names, there are definitely some out there that certainly don't support training, which you mentioned if you were in those shoes, you would, you would leave um, if that was the case for you. There's certainly business out there that underpay. The weird thing is they're happy to be really patient as well. I'll say, look, we're not upping our salary. If we need takes us six months to find some, we'll wait six months. But that in itself for me is undervaluing the importance of that individual. Yeah. Because if you think you can wait six months because payroll is not important, <laughs> then really you're setting yourself up for failure anyway. And it will cost you a lot more in the long term, in the long run, which is a shame. Let's hope it changes. 
So with legislation changing so fast in, in payroll, Kate, what do you think the HMRC can do at the moment to improve payroll delivery? Well, just two really simple things to my mind. Listen to the experts on the outside and learn from what they're telling you. Those two things, they would make a world of difference if only we could try and get that back to where we were 10 or 15 years ago when I started out being a lobbyist and, and doing some of this work. Nice, clear and concise. I think there'll be lots of people potentially rewinding this last uh, 10 minutes <laughs> listening to it through a couple of times because I think there's some really good practical advice that you've given here. So last question before we end the vault. What do you think can still be done to improve the status of the industry as a whole? I think somehow we've got to rebrand ourselves because when I became originally, I was a staff manager at, at M&S and latterly, suddenly I was an HR manager or an HR business partner. We've got to do that in payroll. We've got to get rid of that wages clerk tag that seems to still hang around from the 50s and 60s. And we've got to become employment tax specialists. If And I know employment tax is only a tiny bit of what we do. But boy, it sounds so much more powerful for some reason than payroll. So if words mean a lot and mm. rebranding can do what it's done for HR, then somehow we've got to do that. And we've also got to embrace the payroll apprenticeship that I've been working on, that Ian Holloway has been marvellous in creating and crafting for us, because that is the future of our profession, bringing people in who want to do this as a career and supporting them through that qualifications journey, that will turn us away from that assumption that we just press a button once a month and then go and do our knitting in between. <laughs> no, fantastic. And I'm really excited to say as well, I don't know if you're aware, Kate, but we've got Ian coming onto the Payroll podcast to talk all about the apprenticeship scheme at a later episode. It's an amazing piece of work that uh, he's taken forward. Fantastic. Well, we're going to open the okay. Entering the vault. What would be one piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now? Believe that it's a profession, not a job. Great. Fantastic. With the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? That's a difficult one because all the things I've done have led me on to other things. Perhaps it was simply that I would never have become self-employed if m and hadn't decided to get rid of all of our team and set up a shared service centre in another part of the country. And perhaps I should have been braver sooner to think I've actually got some skills that might be useful elsewhere in the outside world. So circumstances conspired to give me an opportunity. Perhaps I should have been braver and, and you know, made that happen sooner. It was out of your hands. I actually remember when that happened. We were involved, probably not to your benefit, Kate, but at the time I worked for a different group and uh, we were involved with that relocation project. And I remember how big scale it was at the time, many years how ago. Weird. What happened, of course, is that many of the people came to work at that shared service centre up in Manchester from Ceridian, which it was in those days. And then latterly, I mean, outsourced yeah. the payroll back to Ceridian and cheapened everybody back again. So some of these strategic decisions that get taken that involve payroll on the face of it, do look very strange. Outsourcing isn't always a silver bullet. <laughs> Insourcing isn't always a silver bullet, but people will try all, all manner of things, won't they? Oh, no, they do. I mean, one of the things I've loved, I guess, benefit of being in this industry for a long time, like yourself, is the cyclical nature yes. of it. people outsourcing, coming back. I mean, it's great. It's yes, like, it's busy, yeah. They do improvement <laughs> in business. But <laughs> we're either working with bureaus who are suddenly growing because everyone's outsourcing or working back with the, the employers who are bringing everything back in-house. <laughs> Um, and they're always changing yeah. systems, which is great. <laughs> if you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Well, I'm going to say something that is probably not what any of your other speakers have said, and it's actually nothing to do with the payroll industry. But I okay. firmly think that if HMRC had some proper ministerial oversight, which they have never had because they are considered to be an independent department, we would be in a better position than we are now because they would be more easily held to account on behalf of their customers and the taxpayers. Great. High level response as well. Fantastic. Who motivates you then, Kate? And why do they motivate you? Well, you have to be very self-motivated when you work on your own, as I do, when you haven't got any other employees. But therefore, as I've mentioned while we've been talking, it's putting good people around you in your network. And the great minds that I sitting committee meetings with and exchanging emails with constantly bring me back down to earth that I am only scratching at the surface of what I do. 
there are some incredibly clever people out there. But that makes me want to try harder to be the best that I can in the time that I've got left in this industry. And it's those people that have made me carry on doing what I'm doing. Brilliant. Thank you. So last question for the podcast. If you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? Well, this is going to sound really strange, given the conversation we're having and what I do for a living. But I wanted to be a filing clerk when I left school because I'm oh, really? incredibly <laughs> shy. I don't like the social interaction or anything. I have to absolutely put on that today you're going to be Kate Upcraft, a lecturer. Um, so any job that involved me sitting quietly, not having to interact with people, filing, and I was a professional proofreader at MS at one point in my career, which I also loved because it was very detailed and I didn't have to do all the social stuff that you find really difficult when you're as shy as I am. So, yeah, that's what I'd be doing. Wow. No, that really wasn't the response <laughs> I was expecting. Well, you're now Kate Uppercraft, the podcaster as well. So you've got a new string to your bow. You've got that, must have that facade on for us. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure. A real phenomenal conversation uh, with you today, Kate. I really appreciate you giving up your time. I must add, for anyone interested in finding out more about Kate, please do go to kateupcraft.com. There's loads of information there. She's got a fantastic blog. You can subscribe to Kate's newsletter, and there's lots of information about the services she provides that range from health checks, training, consultancy, her forthcoming events, current projects, loads of information. So please do take a look. That's kateupcraft.com. It just leaves me to say a huge thank you, Kate, for joining me today on the Payroll Podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on board. I very much look forward to speaking to all the listeners again on the next pod next week. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.